Yes, I'm afraid the North has an unenviable record when it comes to suicide, especially among young people. Now, in a moment, we'll be hearing from a father from Cumbria whose daughter took her own life in 2018 and is now campaigning to get suicide prevention on to the school curriculum. Also coming up... We'll hear from the charity in County Durham, which says a funding shortage has forced it to cut back its work on suicide prevention. I just want to prevent one person going through what I went through as a brother. Um, and ultimately that's what we continue to strive to do, no, no matter how much we grow and how many people, it's always about that one person and making a difference and trying to keep that one person alive. Also on the show, for generations we buried our household waste in landfill sites near the coast, but now tons of rubbish are at risk of spilling onto beaches and into the sea. We found lead, cadmium, you can find lumps of it, uh, arsenic and things like that on the beach itself. Um, and then there's the physical material like all of the, the, the old caterpillar tracks and um, uh, various bits of pipe and stuff and domestic waste as well. Well, my guests for the next half an hour to discuss quite a lot of that are the Labour MP for Bladen, Liz Twist. Next to her, Andy Airy, that father from Cumbria who I mentioned, who was one of three dads walking, has been raising money and awareness too about the risk of suicide among young people. And joining us via the web is the Conservative MP for Thurscombe Moulton and a Government Minister as well now, Kevin Hollinray. Welcome to all three of you today. Uh, first to that tough but very important subject, we want to devote a considerable part of today's programme to the issue of suicide. It's the biggest killer of those aged under 35 and the North East has the highest rate in the country, and therefore, therefore of course it affects so many people. Including Andy Airy, whose daughter Sophie was brought up in Kendall in Cumbria and later became an oncology nurse. She took her life in 2018. Along with two other bereaved fathers, Andy's been doing all he can to help other families avoid the pain he's experienced. Three Dads Walking, as they've become known, have raised thousands of pounds for charity in memory of their daughters, and they've gathered 157,000 names on a petition calling for suicide prevention to be a compulsory part of the school curriculum, a campaign that will be debated in Parliament on March the 13th. Uh, Andy Airy, thanks, thanks for, for coming in. Um, I've obviously huge impact already on your campaign. Why is it so important to you to get suicide prevention as a compulsory part of the national curriculum? Well, it was only after we lost Sophie that we found out that suicide is the biggest killer of, of young people in this country. So that was in 2018 is when we lost Sophie. Uh, when Mike and Tim and I get, got together in 2021 and did our first walk between our houses, um, we met many, many, many suicide bereaved parents on that walk when we walked from Cumbria to Manchester and across to, to Norfolk. And we had the same kind of conversation every day. When these people came out and spoke to us, they said, like us, they hadn't seen it coming. Um, and like us, after the event, they realised that suicide was the biggest killer of young people um, and that, that up to 200 school aged children take their own lives each year. And then they said, why didn't anybody tell us? So by the time we actually got to Shuldham at uh, Tim's house in near Kings Lynn, we'd kind of developed a bit of a, a righteous anger, I think, a bit of indignation with that question. Why didn't anybody tell us? If, if suicide's the biggest killer of our young people in this country, why aren't we talking about it? As a society, why aren't we talking about it? Uh, so it was then that we decided we, well, we had to do something because we, we felt it wasn't just the three of us. Suddenly we had this collective voice from all these suicide bereaved parents that we met along the way, uh, which prompted us to write to the government um, before Christmas 2021. And we've kind of been in conversation with them ever since. 157,000 signatures, I mean, quite remarkable, really. You, you need, obviously, quite a number to get into pub. Did you expect to get that kind of level of support? <laughs> well, well, we knew we had two thresholds. There's a 10,000 threshold, which prompted a written response, so that was the first thing to hit, and then £100,000 for the, for the petition to be de debated in Parliament, and obviously we were aiming at that, but um, did we expect to hit it? No idea. But the, the, way, it, the way it happened, um, it, people obviously picked it up and got behind it and wanted to sign it. As it stands, it, it is actually the second biz biggest petition on the government website. Now. Um Rishi Sunak has agreed to meet you from a question from your local MP. Mm. What, what, what are you going to say to him when you get that opportunity? <laughs> now that's a good question. <laughs> uh, the, the question we've got is exactly what, we, what I was talking about before. 
it's a question of risk. If this is the biggest risk to our young people, why aren't we doing something about it? Obviously our particular aim is let's get it in schools. Because if it is a, a compulsory part of the school curriculum, it will have to be talked about. Um, we appreciate it's a very difficult, very challenging and really quite a scary subject. Uh, and certainly we aren't uh, experts in how it can be done, but we had a great privilege just before Christmas. We were actually in the school in Alston, where we saw a Cumbrian charity, Every Life Matters, delivering suicide prevention workshops to 11, 12 year olds and 15, 16 year olds. And it was incredibly powerful. But the key thing, it, it wasn't difficult and it wasn't complicated, but it was a safe environment and a um, these young people were having a conversation about uh, feelings, emotions and risk and talked about suicide but the critical thing that they were talking about was help seeking behaviour. You know, they, they, they all came out of those lessons with an understanding that if things got tough the thing to do was not bottle it up and try and sort everything themselves but to reach out and ask for help you know whether that was to friends or family or teachers or whoever it may be. So seeing it being delivered showed it's not difficult, it's not complicated and we should just be, do it. Uh, let's twist. Uh, yeah. I know you obviously got very personal experience yes. of this. You, you, you mentioned it in your first speech in Parliament, which is your yeah. your husband committed suicide what, about 19, 20, well, more than 20 years ago. Yes, now. more than 20 years ago. Yeah, now, yeah. Yes. Um, um, what do you make of this campaign? You know, what, why is it important? Do you think to to you know to tackle some of these issues? Well, I mean, I, I think it's hugely important that people talk about suicide. People sometimes feel that by talking about it they make it worse, but actually, it's exactly the opposite, mm, isn't it, Andy? Exactly. It's about making sure that people know they can talk about about suicide and talk about how they're feeling as well. So it's really important work that Andy and the other guys are doing, and people like Matthew uh, are doing to make sure that young people are able to talk about that and be educated and then of course the same goes for older people as well you know if you talk about male suicide we really need to get men talking about about it as well um obviously there are a whole lot of complex circumstances going to anybody's decision to take their life what part do you think though given the northeast record here mm. does poverty deprivation play in it well, I think that it plays a, a large part. We know there have been studies done by Samaritans and others that show the impact of, um, well, the posh word is socioeconomic factors, but, you know, just not having um, jobs, being unemployed, being short of money, having those pressures is hugely important. So I think that, I think that the government needs to tackle that side as well as the... Um, you know, all the other things in the National Suicide Prevention Strategy that they'll be talking about. Um, Kevin Hollenrake, um, I mean, I'm sure you will have dealt with, um, you know, families in your constituency with this. What do you make of it? I mean, should the government be acting on this to try and respond to Andy's petition, make this compulsory? Well, yes. I mean, we definitely should be taking action, and we are. But can I first pay tribute to Andy, Mike and Tim, and indeed Liz, um, all who turned an absolute tragedy into something purposeful and we should absolutely recognise what they're doing. Um, of course we should take action. I, I, you're right, I've dealt with a case, Andrew Bellaby, uh, my constituents, a needless, uh, unavoidable suicide and uh, it is absolute tragedy but again the family, concerned the Bellaby family, you know, works hard to try and bring these matters to light. It's absolutely right that Andy's doing that and uh, you know, I, I will definitely listen into that debate in March and um, by all means I mean I think it's I'm right in saying I think mental health is a mandatory part of the curriculum now in schools but I don't think suicide prevention specifically is it's an interesting point and I would have no objection in principle to that but and it's something we should definitely look at as wider uh, as part of that wider uh, suicide prevention strategy that's been rolled out later this year. Okay thank you for, for now. Well, much of the work that is being done on suicide prevention relies upon local charities. Martin Lindsay has been to visit one group in County Durham which says it's having to cut back on its work because of a lack of funds. He was my older brother, but he was my, my best friend. Um, he, was, he was always happy. Um, I, I, I idolised him, really did. Daniel O'Hare took his own life in 2005 at the age of just 19. His death devastated his family, including his younger brother, Matthew. It's still now... You know, kind of, for, for me, after all this time, to look back and think, still why? Um, how, how could somebody who, who seems so happy on the, on the outside be, be to that sort of point and that sort of kind of distress on the inside that 
that they would then make the decision to take their own lives. All right. Hiya. Matthew now runs the suicide prevention charity If You Care Share, which he co-founded alongside other family members in Daniel's memory. I always remember when we started this and you know started talking about If You Care Share and Dan, um, I always said, I had a camera in front and said, I just want to prevent one person going through what I went through as a brother. Um, and ultimately that's what we continue to strive to do. No, no matter how much we grow and how many people, it's always about that one person and making a difference and trying to keep that one person alive. Um, and to do that, we have to prevent people from feeling that way, but also acting on, on them feelings and them thoughts. And one of the people the charity has helped is Fred. In 2018, I um, decided to uh, reach out to If You Care Share um, following an attempt to take my own life. If You Care Share, they've given me the insight and the ability to manage their difficulties, you know, and generally promoting the way that I like to relax, which to me has become just invaluable to my quality of life. Where do you think you'd be without If You Care Share's help? I wouldn't be here. Um, that would be the top and bottom of it. Any thoughts on what I mean by that? What are emotions? You can just shout out. How you feel, love that. I'm going long, ready? Here at North Durham Academy in Stanley, Matthew's given a talk to students about suicide prevention, but he's worried for the future because the charity scaled back some of its services, blaming a lack of funding. It says it gets no money at all from central government. We may have made the decision that we would have to fund this ourselves to ensure that we were still able to support people across the North East. But we were getting to the point where are we here for some people or for nobody at all in terms of unfortunately the financial impact it was having on the organisation, um, which I hate to say and I hate to have to do and we hate to do as an organisation because you know, suicide doesn't discriminate, it affects us all. Latest figures show the North East has the highest suicide rate in the country and the vast majority of those who take their own life are men. Matthew and the charity are desperate to change that, but they say they need help. Some more money from central government to help your suicide prevention work, you're convinced that would save lives. Fewer people would die in the North East if that happened. 100%. 100%. I say that with 100% conviction. Um, we know it makes a difference and we know it saves lives. Martin Lindsay reporting. Well, the government says several organisations, including the Sunderland Samaritans and Middlesbrough and Stockton Mine, received a share of £5.4 million last year to help prevent suicide in high-risk groups. And ministers say they're investing an additional £2.3 billion into mental health services across England. Now, I did use a phrase in that uh, question to Kevin, which I shouldn't have used, which is committed suicide. Andy picked me up correctly on that, which is people take their own lives, people kill themselves. Uh, so I apologise for that. Uh, we all need to learn a lot more about this, uh, which is what your campaign is about, of course, uh, Andy. Uh, obviously, you saw, obviously, that charity doing the kind of work you want to see done in schools. Is it disappointing to see it struggling for money? It's disappointing to see that it falls on charities to, to deliver what um, should be built into the uh, structure of education. You know, one of the things that we came across, just thinking about funding, was um, the amount of money that the government spend on the PREVENT programme, you know, which is the anti-radicalisation um, programme that's run for over 10 years now, which is embedded in all education, all um, uh, colleges, it's got to be done. At the moment, they're spending something like forty-five million pounds a year on that program. Forty-five million pounds a year. I mean, obviously, radicalisation is a risk, but as it stands, they don't even address suicide prevention, um, which of course causes far more deaths than radicalisation and terrorism. Th th thousands and thousands of deaths a year. Thousands of deaths a year. So it seems crazy. There's we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't spend on radicalisation, but let's put risk in some kind of context. We, should, we need to look at the biggest risk to our, peop, our young people's lives and address it accordingly. Okay. Um, Kevin Hollenreich, um, obviously one charity or they're struggling for money, but I suppose it's symptomatic really, isn't it, of, of, of this problem not being treated seriously enough. There was a National Audit Office report this week into mental health support, for instance, which said, recognise you put some more money in, but said there were still huge gaps, huge backlogs, particularly for young people getting support. 
Well, there's huge demand, and that's the problem. And um, so we have to confront that fact. I mean, we're putting record amounts of money into the NHS generally, £180 billion pounds this year, third highest fund of health, of health services in the EU, in, the, in Europe, I should say. But um, if but I mean, this, what this report says is, is if there's still a backlog of people, and if there's also, what this also report also said was that there were huge vacancy numbers amongst psychiatrists, amongst the staff that needed, sure. it's not enough, is it? But, uh, you can always do more, Richard. You're absolutely right, and it's no. And I'm sure, you know, as Andy was saying, we want to put more into this. We are putting 57 million pounds, I think, a year into suicide prevention specifically. But, but you see these backlogs for uh, psychiatric care in all uh, different parts of the of the world. I think the, the waiting list in Canada now is a year. I read recently. So there's just massive demand on the system. We are putting more and more money in. But demand is outstripping the supply. You know, of course, we've got to keep looking at this, improve how we do things, how we deliver things. I do think charities do a fantastic job at this, and there's more money going in, into charities, and it shouldn't just be the public sector we fund on this. You, you know, the third sector, like charities, do a fantastic job, and it's right that we allocate money to them to, to help with this, but it, it is a huge task. I think we've got to look at social media. And there's definitely... And there's definitely got to be some kind of connection between social media. And I've got four children and I've seen what some of the difficulties they've gone through in their lives. And some of that is is um, as a result of social media pressure. And I think maybe we should have a conversation about the social media giants that we should be funding some of this so we can put extra okay. resources into the system because we need it. OK, thank you for that. Um, Liz Twist. Uh, um what do you make of the current funding situation? I mean, the government is putting more money in, it is taking mental health more seriously, but is it enough? Um, no, it's not enough, but more importantly, it's, it's how uh, that money gets there, because voluntary organisations do a huge amount, like If You Care Share, I work with Matthew uh, a lot, they do a huge amount, and they need to have that funding. Last year, I had the opportunity to talk to Sajid Javid when he was health minister about what we needed, actually, from the last budget, um, and what we need is the funding to um, support the work at local level. Um, the current funding streams are kind of coming to an end uh, and we need that money at local level so that people like Matthew uh, and other organisations can actually carry on that absolutely vital work. Another interesting thing, actually, okay, Richard... OK, all right. I'm, I'm going to... I just want to bring Andy in. We're running out of time. Okay. I want to give Andy the final word. You heard that what Kevin said about social media there. Is, is that something that's, that, it, that is, needs addressing as well? Uh, it, yes, definitely runs a, lot, uh, a, a different aspect, but definitely uh, is important. Um, actually, on Friday, last Friday, uh, Dame Floella Benjamin spoke on the Ofcom bill in the House of Lords, and a lot of the words she used were actually written by us. Uh, it's strange that we've actually got uh, our voices being heard in different places, but it is vitally important. But critically, when it comes down to it, we need to address the risk. I'll, I'll, all I get people to go away and think about is, if suicide is the biggest risk to our young people's lives, we need to do something about it. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Much power to your campaign. And of course, there is help out there if you or your family have been affected by suicide or anything we've discussed today. You can find advice and information on the BBC's Action Line. Just search for bbc.co.uk slash action line.